Happy Wednesday evening. Am I on? Good deal. So, I have the pleasure of delving into the parables um, of Jesus according to the Gospels. Can everybody hear me okay? The parables of Jesus according to the Gospels. <clears throat> when I took on that uh, topic that Carrie threw out there, I said, yeah, I'll take that. I'll take the parables of Jesus according to the Gospels. It was um, several months ago. <clears throat> and as I thought about it, I thought, man, there's a lot of parables. <laughs> and there's a very short period of time. I mean, according to weeks. I think I have 10, 10 nights that I can actually you know, talk about parables. So how am I going to cram 42 parables in 10 nights? Well, I'm not. So we are, the syllabus that I came up with is that we're going to cover according to um, uh, topics, if you will. So <clears throat> tonight is going to be an introduction as far as as far as parables and what Jesus wanted to convey um, about his stories and how they will relate to um, the salvation of those that we're actually hearing and give them something to think about. And what I'm going to say a little bit later on is some fell on deaf ears, like the Pharisees just fell on their deaf ears, and some wanted to hear it. Like us here tonight, we would love to hear a parable. If Jesus was here, we would love that. We would love to hear what he would have to say. He was a great teacher. So tonight is going to be an introduction. I don't have a PowerPoint, but I plan on having that next week, along with um, some study guides to go, to go through. But um, uh, the next week, we're going to be studying about <clears throat> the sower of the seeds, uh, the mustard seed, and the growing seed. And that's going to be next week. So we're going to be talking about that. Um, then the next week we're going to be talking about the worth of the kingdom. And uh, uh, we'll be talking about the lost coin, uh, the pearl of a great price. And um, we're kind of lumping these together as far as what I see, how they would all blend. <clears throat> And I have, I broke it down into 12 different nights, so we might have to double up. But anyway, the parables of Jesus according to the Gospels. <clears throat> and now as I was typing this out, um, I just came up with a different, a lot of different thoughts that I wanted to put down, and I don't know, I think that uh, we'll be done in plenty of time. So, if you have a question while I'm speaking, just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll, we'll knock that out. We will uh, address that. So, what are parables? What are they? Oh, and everybody says, oh, they're an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's, that's like the go-to definition. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Um, and that's how Jesus portrays them. When Jesus was here on earth and ministering to his followers. He often, as we know, told them stories that are called parables. And um, it would also, it would illustrate a very important point. Jesus always had a point behind the stories or the parables that he told. As we know, Jesus is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. We find this in uh, Hebrews, the 12th chapter in the second verse. He knew by telling and engaging in an interesting story that he would draw the crowd to him and communicate difficult or perhaps um, painful truths in a way that they could easily grasp or they could understand or at least give the people that heard the story something to digest mentally as they went on their daily lives. 
Has anybody ever told you a story um, or you had a conversation with somebody and then you left and then you think, oh, that's what that person was talking about. Now I know. Now I know. You were engaged with that person. You had your heart open. You were engaged with that person. And if you didn't quite understand it and you didn't ask, well, then you were so enthralled with that, it finally kicked in. The people that Jesus was talking to, he was either talking to people about, um, he was either talking to the Pharisees, or he was talking to people that wanted to hear about salvation. So we know that we call the stories that Jesus told parables. We know that. That's been established. The Greek word for parable is parabolo. P-A-R-A-B-A-L-L-O. It's a compound of two words. The first part of the word para means, and when I looked this up, it, it means beside or alongside. And to make things more confusing to me, my simple thinking, is that the second part of the word, balo, means to throw. Now, how does that all go together as far as parabolo or parable is concerned? So what I came up with is that, so to teach a parable is literally to throw a lesson alongside the true object of doctrine. That's what I came up with. So, and I think that that's pretty much that's pretty much correct. Um, so the teacher, as we know, is Jesus. And he illustrates the stories by describing a very important lesson. Parables illustrate to us spiritual lessons in the life of the characters. And parables are different than fables. You shouldn't confuse those. Totally different than fables. Um, fables can also tell a moral story, but they're about people in real life situations in an earthly uh, lesson, but not necessarily a spiritual lesson. Parables have an earthly lesson that is also can be portrayed as a spiritual lesson. Jesus knew how to get to the heart of a story, and he knew that his listeners wanted to hear what he had to say. And he was a fantastic teacher. We are very lucky to have the Bible um, to go by as a guideline for our, our salvation. Stories in the Bible particularly have a lot of power. They paint a picture They tell a story that has features, that has benefits. They ask a question. They take you on a journey, if you will. They analyze stories, and they are vivid. And then your audience can identify with that story. You see what I'm saying? Is there any questions up to this point? Any comments as I ramble on here? Why do you think Jesus used parables in the first place? <clears throat> Larry? True. Yep, very, very true. Ian? Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. Kate? <laughs> That's that that is very true. Mona? That's true. That's very true. You know, when I, when I think about and, and read about these parables, um, I'll get you in just a second, Jessica. When I was reading about some of these parables, and I have some of them that, are, that I actually am going to read, but what I was thinking about is, this is Jesus teaching these parables to his all different aspects of life, I mean, as far as his followers and those that didn't follow him. But I was thinking, what wisdom, what wisdom he had in order to make these, um, in order to paint a picture, in order to make these parallels. And uh, that's, if we have been studying, if we have been um, trying to grow in our wisdom and knowledge, then we have we are gaining that wisdom that we can pass on to other generations. And I believe that you know that's very that's very important uh, for us to do that, Jessica. Absolutely. Did I see another hand? Mary, did you have a comment? Very, very true. Good comments. Thank you. Anybody else? Jenny. That's true. That is very true. Um, going on here, I made some more notes. The disciples wanted to know why not just reveal everything plainly? Why don't you just put it all out there without, you know, trying to prove a point or hyperbole or exaggeration? Why don't you just tell them? And then they asked that question in Matthew. I'm going to read a little bit here. Matthew, the 13th chapter, um, verses 10 through 13, if you uh, want to open your Bibles there. Matthew 13, verses 10 through 13. <clears throat> This was after the parable of the sower. He said, the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. So human, human ears, they hear many sounds. 
But there's a deeper kind of listening when it comes to spiritual understanding. We need to dissect and we need to dig into the scriptures in order to understand fully what is being applied or how it's being said or how we can understand what Jesus is talking about. We need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. So when speaking in the parables, Jesus was not hiding truth from sincere people that wanted to be spiritually educated. Those people were the ones that were spiritually receptive to the truth and understood his illustrations. They wanted to be educated. They wanted to know. They had a hunger to know the truth. And we find out that those people were spiritually receptive to what Jesus had to say. To the others, they were only stories. They were only stories to them without any meaning, to the ones that were not receptive. In verse 12, <clears throat> I read that and reread that. It says, whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. We are responsible to use well what we have. When people reject Jesus, their hardness of heart drives away or renders the little useless understanding that they had. And his teachings divide people into two groups based on their own responses. And that to me is what verse 12 indicates. Larry? Mm -hmm. it's said by the one person it's said by the one it mm -hmm. has to be a basic understanding the language has to have a basic understanding of the vocabulary involved of the setting etc that's in the middle group at the same time though the only way that a person can understand a parable is to ask the person who wrote the parable is that this is this is a concept that Yeah, he does, definitely. And see, that's, and we'll find out in a little bit that the Pharisees, they didn't even want to know. They were looking at their own good works for their own salvation. They didn't want, they didn't want anything to do with it at all. Um, but no, that's, that's a good point. Um, so we being spiritual, we tend to grasp for those spiritual truths. You know, it's almost a need. We need those. We need to be, when we come here and uh, when we meet, whether it is uh, tonight, whether it's Sunday morning or Sunday night, or if it's for, you know, a, a special baptism or something like that, um, that, is, that is spiritual wellness that just, you know, kind of drives us. I mean, that's the way that we are made up. That's the way that we feel convicted in our heart. <clears throat> Because it's not, we just don't live here and now. We are looking at, you know, this big picture. And um, <clears throat> we want to live forever after this earth, spiritually with, with all those that have gone before us, if they're there, and, and, uh, and Jesus. 
So, like I said, there's 42 parables total. There's 22 parables in the book of Matthew. There's 10 parables in the book of Mark. And there are 10 in the book of Luke. So there's a total of 42 parables. Besides the obvious moral of the story, um, there is much to be learned in the parables about the nature of God and the love of Christ. And hopefully when we go through this series, we'll be able to um, gather that information and we can comprehend it. As We already know that the love of Christ is just so abundant. But when we look at these parables, you'll get a little bit greater understanding. So there are several, actually five things that I came up with that parables teach us. One is great stories teach us something about God. <clears throat> in the parable of the wheat and the weeds over in Matthew, the 13th chapter, um, it's a little latter, well, starting in verse 24, um, we're reminded how easy it is to judge one another. It's, it's easy to just, you know, think to yourself, oh, what is wrong with that guy? You know, he's like down and out, and he's asking for money, and um, he probably, you know, who knows what we think of. We start to judge a, per a person, and we just had a lesson on that not too long ago about judging one another. And um, I was going into a Chipotle, no, Baja Fresh, one night, late at night, it was just before they closed, and there was a guy who said, would you buy me a burrito? And I thought, sure, I'll buy you a burrito. And so he gave me his order, and I went and bought him a burrito, and I told the, the gal, I said, just put that in a separate bag. And um, so anyway, I, did I start to judge? Yeah, that was my first inclination as far as um, he's probably around in that area all the time, um, but who am I to be, who am I to judge that? If he's hungry, has he asked people before for that? Probably so. He probably that's the way he lives his life. Maybe he is, but I don't want to deny him food, so I bought him something. Um, in the parable of the wheat and the weeds in Matthew the thirteenth chapter, we're reminded how easy it is to judge one another, and. It's so hard for us to know, like I said, the actual truth of a person. It's tough. Do you guys find it difficult at times when you see somebody in the middle of a median and they are there day in and day out? I mean, you know, they're just there all the time. That's their corner that they work. There are people that are like that, but there's also people that have been there, done that, and, um, and they're better. They're just better. I had a call today from Madison. She called me. She's coming home tonight. She's got, got some time off, so she's coming home tonight. She called me, and um, she was real upset. She said, my card isn't working. Something's wrong with her debit card. And I said, okay. And she said, uh, I need to get it to work. And I said, okay. And she's very upset because she needed to fill up her car. So <clears throat> the guy, the cashier, used to be homeless. He used to be on one of those corners. And he spotted her that. He said, I used to be where you are, not homeless, but she just couldn't, she didn't have a way to get any cash or money to fill up her car. He said, I used to be, and he came out to her car and said, don't worry about it, I got you. And I'm thinking, wow. He ended up getting his money, by the way. But it's just the thought that he used to be homeless. 
Whether he was a beggar or not, I don't know, but he was homeless. He was out in the streets. And he said, I used to be where you are. I'm going to pass this along to you. So I don't know. Who are we to judge, right? But the judge and the only one judge is God. He is our, he is our judge. And he's the one that judges the hearts and minds of man. In Luke, uh, the 15th chapter, um, 3 through 7, Jesus tells a parable about the lost sheep. Luke 15, verses 3 through 7. So the parable about the lost sheep, which was found, he rejoiced, the shepherd rejoiced over the sheep that was found. And when he has found, he lays it on his shoulders. He puts that sheep on his shoulders and he rejoices that he found that one lost sheep. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous people who need repentance. This is a picture that Jesus painted of a loving, tender, and merciful God who loves to save the lost and restore them to himself. So as we look into these parables, we need to look at the written word that's in the Bible and keep in our mind that there is always a sign pointing to God. Like if you could see a sign point, a signpost, and we feel like we have been lost, there's always a way to go. There's always a way back. Great stories teach us something about ourselves. So it, they teach us something about God. They teach us something about ourselves. And sometimes the truth of these parables, sometimes they hurt. Or you may say to yourself, wow, you know, those, that, that really hit me. That really hit home. And, um, and while a story, like a parable of the talents in Matthew, the 25th chapter, um, Matthew 25, 14 through 30, it may be the encouragement we need to recognize that we too have talents given to us for the glory of God and our fulfillment. We all have different talents in this congregation. And it's up to us to use them to their fullest. <clears throat> Remember the story of the, uh, the beggar at the marriage feast in Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 1 through 10. it really hits home for, for me as far as what that was all about. So the story of the beggar being slighted at this lavish marriage, it was a celebration, and then given the place of honor, it ranked people, the way that I understand this. It ranked them. And the uncomfortable response to the story of the marriage feast is, is that it conveyed. Um, let's let's turn over there and let's uh, let's read that a little bit. Uh, Matthew the twenty second chapter. <clears throat> starting at the, at the very beginning of the chapter. I think part of my stuff was cut off. Anyway, Jesus spoke to them again in parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a, a wedding banquet for his son. 
He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone that you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. What is this parable trying to explain? What is Jesus saying about this parable, about that nobody was coming to the wedding banquet? What is, what is he trying to get across? Anybody? Ian? Ian? Very, very true. Yes, Larry? Right. Absolutely. Anybody else? <clears throat> we need to keep in mind that what God preaches to us or what he says to us, you know, they, um, they do have a meaning and we need, really need to pay close attention. You know, great stories that he tells, it also illustrates... Um, our need for something and our greatest need of course is um, redemption and our sin our sin guarantees us death right so without something or someone to stand in our place um, it makes it tough because we are sin and if it wasn't for Christ and his willingness to go to the cross and die, we wouldn't have anybody standing in our place. So, there are parables that illustrate our sinful nature, like the wayward and reckless prodigal son, um, the unforgiving or unmerciful servant, or the son who told his father one thing and did another. 
Jesus told his, the people that would be listening to him and the crowd, that included both disciples and Pharisees, that the sinful heart of man is what defiles him. Not the thing that he chooses to put in his mouth, it is how our heart and our mind handles the process that comes out. So we need to be careful about when we listen or when we take something in our, in our mind and we, and we listen, we need to make sure that what comes out of that is, is um, positive because it's a gift. It is a gift. In Matthew, the 18th chapter, um, uh, it's the parable of the um, unmerciful servant. So Jesus tells a man he owed the king a large sum of money, <clears throat> and when he could not pay it back, Jesus tells... Um, I'm sorry, when he couldn't pay it back, the, uh, the king ultimately spared his life and uh, he forgave him his debt. But that same man would not forgive somebody else that owed him money of, of, a, of a much smaller amount. And, um, and when the king learned of that, he had him thrown in jail because he wouldn't show the same kind mercy that the king himself had extended to this, to this person to this man. Jesus is showing us our need for forgiveness and redemption. But then, you know, the Pharisees, they could not um, understand that. They wanted credit for their own so-called hard work um, toward their own salvation. And they totally missed the whole entire point. We also know that these stories, these parables serve as a guide in Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Um, it's the, parage, uh, the parable of the marriage feast. Matthew uh, 22, uh, 1 through 14. Jesus tells that parable, and it serves as a guide um, to, you know, to the truth. There are those who know of Christ, but refuse him as Lord and Savior. And in the end of this parable, he says, for many are invited, but few are chosen. With that kind of guidance, our choice to follow Christ should gain clarity and definition and perhaps some resolve as well. <clears throat> and we'll get into these parables a little bit deeper. And then there's also, you know, parables that they tell us a great story about who the hero is. If you're reading a book, which I don't do, this one I do, I just am not a reader at all. Um, Lisa and Madison are? That's fine. It's good for them. But uh, I'm just not a sit-down type of person and read. I just, unless it's a car manual or something on how to do whatever, then I'll sit down and read it. But <clears throat> I know that <clears throat> great stories do tell, tell us who the hero is. Um, over in Mark, the 12th chapter, uh, the first 12 verses, it talks about um, the tenant of the farmers. And um, we all know who the hero was. Jesus makes sure that the Pharisees and the chief priests understand that Jesus, the hero, the long-awaited Savior, is the one who they were rejecting. They were rejecting him. And these parables, as, as with all the stories in the Bible, remind us of our need for the Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, and always pointing us back to him as our ultimate hope. You know, so if we start rationalizing about our salvation um, 
and we tend to think about what's going to happen. As you get older, you think about what's going to happen, you know, when I pass from this earth. We all can read about it. We all know, but our human, human nature and our human mind thinks, what's, what's going to happen, you know, when you get to that point? Um, and last year, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of funerals. And um, there's, there's people that I know that have passed away in just a matter of a couple of months recently. And so we, we never know. We don't know when our time is going to ha happen. But we need to make sure that um, we concentrate and our focus is, is uh, to that everlasting home with, with God and Christ our Savior. And he always has a way for us. <clears throat> you know, we find out Jesus spoke these parables um, as a narrative to show us that we need him. We definitely need him. And <clears throat> parables are meant to be thought-provoking, they're meant to be compelling. There needs to be, um, we need to think of them as a guide and how Jesus is leading his people. These are all very important when we study these parables because we're going to get into them a lot deeper than, than what we have tonight, of course. But I just kind of wanted to give you a little bit of a of an idea that we're going to be studying these, and I'll have a PowerPoint, and we'll probably have a handout next week as far as where we're going to be going with these. And we're going to be, like I said, clumping some of these together, um, or else we would never finish. Um, but I think it'll be a good study, and it's going to give us a little bit of a better insight and overview of what these parables are about and, and what they mean. And um, next week we'll be... Um, the sower of the seeds, the mustard seed, and uh, the growing seed will be our next lesson or our next class. Any other comments before we wrap things up? Larry? I'll look into that. I'll definitely go that way. I'll check it out and see. Anything else before we wrap it up? Yes, Carol? That is, that is true. I don't know if he was wanting a miracle or if he wanted to see what the reaction was going to be, but I do know that, you know, after his parables, like you said, they were offended and they just turned, turned away, walked away, grumbling and, and um, not very happy at all. Anything else? Then that is it. We finished about four minutes early, and I appreciate your attention and your comments. Thank you very much.